Chase McGrath for the win for the Volunteers. From 40. On the way, a knuckleball. He got it! And here they come. So up, y'all? Welcome on into the Go Balls 24-7 podcast. Wes Rucker coming to you from Fort Rucker Studio here on a rainy, cloudy, kind of rainy, kind of cloudy Monday afternoon in God's Own Knoxville, Tennessee. How are you? I hope you're well. Hope your weekend was a really good one. Uh, if you're a Tennessee fan, you were you had a stress-free weekend, I imagine, unless you're one of those uh, house divided deals where you, you're a fan of Tennessee and kind of a fan of somebody else. If you're just a Tennessee fan, nothing else, you had what I would imagine was a, a pretty, pretty enjoyable a weekend watching college football or, or spending time with the family, not having to worry about whether Tennessee was going to make your life great or terrible uh, for, for the next week or so. Um, Tennessee was off. The Vols did go uh, from number five to number four in the polls, though, because of some games other where three top 10 teams lost and um, Georgia and Alabama uh, w- w- was a great game. There were some other really good games over the weekend. I got to see none of them live. I uh, was, was over in London for, for a week with my wife and it was great and a little jet lag today. But in a great, great mood. It was a good week, and I'm glad to be back. And Tennessee is happy to be back in action this week, too. Arkansas Razorbacks, the Vols go to Fayette Nam on Saturday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern on ABC. We're going to talk about some of the stuff from the past week. We're going to look forward to this week. We're going to do a lot of that stuff. And to do that, we're going to go over to an undisclosed location to get to Patrick Brown, and then we'll go down to that home daycare center and get to Ryan Callahan. Fellas, how are you on this Monday? I'm good. Just uh, reeling from that awesome Braves eighth inning that I just witnessed. Uh, but no, um, yeah, I, we we should start off by saying uh, that just uh, really tough to see some of the the scenes from yes. East Tennessee and, and North Carolina, uh, Western North Carolina, uh, this weekend. I know um, my dad over in South Carolina had, was dealing with some damage, but um, I know some people that have some family in, in some of the more impacted areas, flood wise and just some of the uh just the damage and the devastation is just really uh i mean it just tears at your heart and so um our thoughts are with any of those people that might be listening or if you if you know anybody that you didn't hear from for a while we hope you can reconnect and and all of those things but uh just uh, wanted to get that out of the way early as as josh heupel did on monday at his press conference and uh just uh, thoughts and, and prayers with with everyone that was affected and uh the people that will have uh a sort of a, a maybe a long road back to uh to getting life back to normal after this hurricane came through yeah i'm glad i'm glad you said that because it was it was pretty pretty rough um yeah. obviously I was just watching that i was just watching that on bb because we didn't i mean i watched american television really over there except for maybe seeing international or something there wasn't much to watch there and but it, it was bad yeah. you see interstates going away and, and bridges and it's just evaporating and makes you feel small doesn't it yeah, my, my father-in-law works for uh, the big utility company up in the Tri-Cities, and he's, I think, touring some of their areas that were affected that they can't even get to to get power back on just because of bridges being wiped out and stuff like that. It's just just kind of crazy. Yeah, I know we've got a lot of members in the uh, in the Tri-Cities area, yeah. so I hope everyone has stayed safe up there. And uh, if, if, if you or your loved ones are dealing with any of the uh, the fallout from that, I hope everyone is okay and, uh, and, and comes out of this um, – awful storm uh all right but um yeah it's been it's been wild to watch that from a distance because you know we're, we're pretty close we're only an hour and a half two hours away from that area but it feels like we just didn't even get the same storm almost it's amazing it, it's it was forecasted to go straight through knoxville and it sort of did but we didn't it just wasn't nearly uh, on the same level uh, of anything we see just a couple hours to the east and the northeast yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty rough. And I, when we go through things like this, because because we we'll do shows and we have before where something really sort of terrible has just happened. As as uh, the it looks like the Braves are doing something really good over there because because Patrick is waving. What, what what do you what what do you what's happening there, Pat? We need we need a breaking news update. What what is it? Uh, Ozzy Alves just doubled in, cleared the bases, six seven six in the eighth. How about that? Well, the the Braves have bounced back. So see, life giveth, it taketh away. Um, but in all seriousness, I I, I mean, <laughs> sorry to like, interrupt. My bad. No, 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 no. It's fine. This is the uh, live it, angle of this podcast now. Oh yeah, no, it's great. I, I have no problem with it. 
And I think it's interesting because we've done these shows, right? Like after, you know, different disasters and other places and horrible things and bad news. That's not weather related. Just something happens at a school or something. And it's like, you you, want to like mention it and tell people you're thinking about them. But then I imagine a lot of those people that are Tennessee fans are watching and listening to this and they're like, man, I don't want to hear about it anymore. Like I want to hear about, I want to hear you talk Tennessee football, basketball, baseball. So it's like, you don't want to act like it's not there because you want to acknowledge it, especially if there's a way we can tell people to get involved and help. But then also you, you think like, do do, do people want to hear it then? It's just hard to, it's hard to calculate. So, I mean, I, I guess you just, kind of mention it and then uh, tell people you're thinking about them and then move on and talk about Tennessee football and stuff. Cause it, it, it was, I, I was not able to, to watch some of the games. I was just able to see some highlights and saw some stuff uh, on Wi-Fi and stuff on the way back on the, on the plane back and, and watching things. But man, it, it, here's, here's my first question to y'all. I only watched the highlights of that Georgia Alabama game and it looked really, really good. But people who were calling it like the best game in, in like a, you know, a decade or a long time, was it really better than than Tennessee Bama was a couple of years ago? Because that game went down to like the very last second, and it lead was changing back and forth, big plays. Like, I was it better? Maybe it was. I I don't know. I've only seen like the 15, 20 minute cut up of it. It looked really good. Well, to f- pardon my French, but it was an ass kicking for about three quarters. I mm-hmm. mean, it was twenty eight nothing early second quarter. Alabama was just. Res- uh, to use a term that you probably heard of the weekend, Wes, running rampant or running riot over yeah. Georgia. I mean, it was 28 nothing early second Georgia quarter. Was, Georgia was six and, seven, six and sevens at the back. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, it was, it was, Alabama was up 18 in the fourth quarter, and it, it happened pretty quickly. Uh, you know, Georgia getting going on offense, and and then they couldn't get a stop. Then they get the you know the big touchdown uh, to take the lead there, Georgia, uh, but couldn't hold it. I mean. Uh, it, it, it was a great game turned out to be one. It looked like it was going to be kind of a dud, uh, unless you were an Alabama fan. Um, and, and again, the difference in that Tennessee Alabama game is that, you know, we were all at that one. We were not at this one. So, um, that might've changed things in terms of the, just the, um, the perception and, and just the, you know, all of that. So, um, but it, it was a great game too. I mean, two teams that, you know, a lot of talent on the field and, um, but I mean, Alabama looked really good starting off, and then I, I think Georgia sort of settled in and um, finally just kind of started playing a little bit. Um, uh, but I mean, for three quarters, it was it was wow, Alabama looks really good, and Georgia, what's wrong with Georgia? Um, so uh, the fourth quarter kind of put a little bit of a gloss on it for the Bulldogs, in my opinion. I mean, I think that you look at their first four games. Obviously, that Kentucky win looks a little different now after the Wildcats went to Oxford and won, but. I mean, they struggled in that game. Maybe we're fortunate in some ways. And then, you know, to look that bad for uh, – and it wasn't just the first 20 minutes. To look that bad for the better part of three quarters, I think, was startling given the, the way that they've played in the past. Yeah, I think your your opinion on, on where that game rates, you know, obviously that's a very subjective thing. But I, I think for most people it just kind of comes down to whether you think of a greater game as one that's just back and forth – kind of a seven to 10 point game the whole way like Tennessee Alabama was or whether a big comeback that ends with a close finish kind of trumps that. So I, I think I I can see the case for that to be one of those great, I've not, I've not seen a lot of that discussion. I I, I wouldn't fault someone for thinking that because Georgia was down awfully big and, and came back and, and did it impressively. And when they had to have a stop, you know, got, uh, got a stop late in the fourth quarter there on third and three, I think it was to, you know, one, a great stop by C.J. Allen, one yard short of the first down marker that gave Georgia the chance to take the lead, and they did. And then Alabama comes right back the next play, and then even then Georgia, you know, still drives that Alabama was, in territory and has a chance. That was to one win. of the best plays I've ever seen. That was one. Yeah. That was honest to God. Like I don't want to be. You, you don't want to be like a slave to the moment or something, and say, "Oh, well, the thing that just happens is the greatest thing ever." I don't know if I remember a better play from a wide receiver when you combine the catch with the the, the pirouette and the run down the sideline, and then you – to say nothing of the kid being 17 years old or whatever, I mean, it's ridiculous how I just – I don't – I've seen some great plays over the years. I don't know if I've seen one better than that. And, and yeah, and to, and to follow that up with Georgia still driving back into Alabama territory after that and and having a chance to, to tie the game in the final final minute and then the interception, uh, which which – 
what wasn't a terribly forced throw, but obviously you could have been a little more selective there. They had time. Um, so to put a, put a throw in danger a little bit like that, not a, not a perfect decision, but, uh, but yeah, for it to end that way, you know, after, after Georgia was down by such a big margin early, I guess would be the, the case for it. But I, you know, I'd personally have Tennessee a little bit higher. I think the finish was more dramatic for Tennessee, Alabama for that to be down yeah. to, you know, it looked like Alabama was about to take the lead with a field goal with 15 seconds left and then go back to the other end of the field in two plays and suddenly Tennessee's winning it at the last second on a field goal that was partially blocked and barely cleared the crossbar. I mean, so much about that ending was was amazing. But Well, even, uh, even allegedly allegedly blocked, like there's still no definitive case. It was blocked. I think it, I think it was blocked too, but also like McGrath said that he didn't thought he hit – he didn't think that he hit it great either. So I, I, I still have never gotten – definitive proof of anybody being like yeah 100 percent that was blocked i think it was too. I, I thought i thought there was an alabama player that acknowledged that he got a hand on it. either way it, you saw the official i think didn't the official do the symbol for tipped at the at the line i think there were there was just so much evidence and just the way the ball sailed it seemed to kind of move so i i think it was tipped but either way i that that game for me would be a little bit above it but that, that's that's the big thing I take away from the weekend is just those two teams still look really good. And we obviously didn't know what to think of Alabama. Didn't know what to think of Georgia, really, after what they did at Kentucky. Um, I, I won't be shocked if Georgia just runs the table from here on because this is probably going to wake them up any any deficiencies they had. You know, they'll, they'll be tested at Texas in a few weeks, obviously. But, um, you know, Alabama looked look certainly the, the part. And, and those still two, look like two teams capable of competing for the national championship this year. So, um, you know, that's maybe the bad news for – Tennessee fans and fans of other teams in the SEC is that those those two teams don't look like they're going anywhere at least right now. You know, still we'll see in the long run, but this year those two teams are still going to have a lot to say about the national title race. See, that was my next question. I was going to spin this forward and talk about Tennessee because, and again, I have seen like the you know how MLB.com does like condensed games or whatever. Yeah. I've seen the condensed version of, of 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 Bama Georgia. I didn't watch the entire thing like I normally would, but. My question was, did that make, you know, imagine you're a Tennessee fan. Imagine you're thinking about Georgia and Bama because you're going to play both, obviously. Did that make you more concerned about Alabama or did that make you feel a little bit better if it was possible to feel better about the game at Georgia or did it do neither or both of those things? Uh, to me, it highlighted that I think Tennessee, as well as they, uh, the Vols have played defensively to open the season, um, they have not played a truly elite offense. Um, and so I think that's what it highlighted for me is that they, they've still got some, some good offenses to play, to play. I, I don't, there's still some bad offenses on the schedule too. I mean, Mississippi state Vanderbilt, who else? UTEP, Kentucky, not all, yeah, Kentucky I mean, they're all 80th or they're all 80th or worse, 80th or worst in, um, total offense as the Braves give up a two run home run in the ninth. Uh, so, oh, wow. um, yeah, so they've got some bad offenses still to play, but they, they've also got some teams that, that like Alabama and Georgia, eventually at some point they were just going up and down the field on each other. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, the, each week, I mean, we knew those games are going to be tough, right? So I don't, I don't know that, anything changes uh brad crawford had an interesting tweet where he was like just watch you know tennessee's going to beat alabama and the georgia's going to beat tennessee and there's going to be like a three-way like triangle of each team beating each team and how does that affect the standings and um where you know texas will be in there too texas got to play georgia in a couple weeks yeah so uh yeah i mean that that game obviously if, if tennessee ends up being in in the contention for a spot in the sec championship game then uh, how how those teams play the head to head will matter. So you know there was some relevance to to Tennessee in that in that outcome, but uh, I didn't really change much. I mean, uh, it might have changed something when it was twenty eight nothing, but uh, yeah, I think for just the course of the game, not not so much. Yeah, I was, uh, that's that's what I was curious about, Ryan. Because did it make you feel like Tennessee was like obviously you know Alabama and Georgia are pretty close now, right? Like you can see that they just played and you saw everybody saw how close that game was. So did that make you think that those teams were still a couple notches or a notch above Tennessee, or did that make you think Tennessee possibly had 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 possibly you know reduced the gap there? 
I, I think Tennessee has has closed the gap a little bit, but I, I think Saturday was kind of a reminder that there's still another level for Tennessee to to get to personally. I, I just I just saw so much talent on the field on both sides of the ball in that game that I, I do think there's some things about playing each of those teams that, that are going to just cause some problems for Tennessee, not just because they're good teams, but because it, I don't think Tennessee matches up one through 11 in those starting lineups extremely well across the board. So that – the roster's better. It's on a level where they're obviously ready to maybe make the college football playoff, but it shows me there's still maybe a gap between those teams at the very top that have a chance to win the whole thing and, and maybe Tennessee. Now that that could be just my false impression from four games of, of Tennessee, but I, I get the sense Tennessee's off. I see. I, I can I came away thinking, yes, to your point, Patrick, the defense hasn't been truly tested and I felt that way uh, going into it, but but now we saw what Alabama and Georgia each can do when both of those offenses uh, are rolling. But I I kind of came away thinking Tennessee's offense has to crank it up a notch. I, I think their offense, as crazy as that sounds, the numbers they'd put up in the first three games, they seemed a little hollow to me. Like I, I don't know that this offense, because again, they haven't been tested by a great defense either. Oklahoma a, a little bit. Um, it, I wouldn't put them in the great category. I think it's a good defense. I think it's a um, pretty darn good defense. It's a good Not defense. Well, maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe great's a stretch, but that's a really good, really sound they have, defense. They haven't given oh. up 41 points in a game this season, Ryan. Oh, true. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, Auburn scored 21, and Auburn's pretty terrible. Um, but I, I do think Oklahoma's a good defense. Um, but, but regardless, I, I came away thinking – I mean, and Nico can get there. I just think there's – since the first half or so of the Chattanooga game, the the, the passing game production has been okay, not great. Um, and then they showed their moments, you know, the Dante Thornton play in the Oklahoma game. They just need more moments like that. The, the passing game needs to be a little more on demand, I think, than we've seen the past couple games where when, when they play a team like Alabama, they can answer just like that. And, and I'm not – I'm not sure they're there yet, but they got a couple weeks to sort of get there and continue progressing. Well, I mean, Georgia's defense looked vulnerable, giving up 28 points. Yeah, I mean, they were killing. You know, Milrow was running all over them. There was, uh, you know, they were hitting the tight end easily. He was they didn't cover him all game. Um, yep. And so, and then you know, Alabama's defense gives up some big plays at the end. Uh, and, and there's been, you know, I think there were some chances South Florida had in that game to to take advantage of it. So. Mm-hmm. Um, but those defenses maybe look vulnerable. But certainly, the offenses. That was the what stood out to me was just how how strong those guys are, Wes. Yeah, because my my question w- w- would be, I, I still think, and again, th- th- this is not this is more praise for Tennessee's defensive line than it is crit- criticism of 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 the second two levels. But I think Tennessee's defensive line has been so much better than every group that it's gone against so far that we still don't know a ton about that secondary. Like, you know, you see some of the athletes, obviously the Bama and Georgia have, and you know, they have quarterbacks who can deliver the ball down there. Like if, if Tennessee in those games doesn't just completely dominate the line of scrimmage, like it has, then, then that's going, there's going to be one-on-ones there and there's going to be plays that are going to have to be made. And I'm not saying they can't make them. I'm just saying I'm still, they still haven't to me proved that they can do that in, in in a high level, high stakes kind of, upper upper crust game like that so that that's that would be my question is i think tennessee's defensive line has been so much better than every offensive line that's played that we don't know and th- that doesn't mean that that, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean they're bad on the back that doesn't mean they haven't gotten better it just means we don't know right like i i, I don't i don't know that that they've faced a group i mean oklahoma arnold god bless him could not i mean they had to make that change because that 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 guy he he threw a couple of balls that as soon as he let go of him in that stands, it was like, and Pat was there too. He saw it was like, oh my God, what did he just do? Like it, it, you could just tell because we were up high in the press box and you could see the angle like that's not going to end well. And there were times where he maybe had a guy and he didn't see him or he didn't put the ball where it needed to be. And, and so they had to make a change. And, and so I don't know that we've seen what they'll do in a game like that. You know, yeah. what, what, what what will those safeties look like? Are those young corners every bit as dynamic as it looks like? Or are better receivers going to going to win some battles on them? I, I don't – that's what I'm interested yeah. to see. And I don't know that this week, um, no matter what, no matter how that game goes, I don't know that we'll know that either. I mean, we know this quarterback is a good player. We'll talk about him a little bit in the second segment. We, we know that that's a different challenge for Tennessee in some ways. But maybe the end of the Oklahoma game was – was was helpful for that um you know and arnold's a good athlete too so maybe they've seen 
just enough of that where it, it gives you a little bit because you saw when, in the Oklahoma um, Auburn game, you saw what happened when Auburn split the the Red Sea parted there and the quarterback ran just, man, he looked like he was shot out of a cannon on that touchdown. So we've seen some of those athletes against Tennessee this season. I just don't know that we've seen the amount that, 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 you know, we'll see going forward, but that's interesting to me. I was just curious as to what, what to make of the weekend. Were there any other games before we go to break? Cause I know uh, we probably should talk about Arkansas A&M a little bit. Um, Arkansas looked like it kind of fumbled the bag in some ways in that game, had chances and just, just didn't do it. What, what impressions did y'all take away if you saw that game? Well, I, I've probably watched Arkansas maybe two and a half games uh, of Razorbacks this season, just because Tennessee's playing night games and they're yeah. playing early in the day. So, you know, first half of the Oklahoma State game, you're like, man, that game's going to be tougher. And then second mm-hmm. half and overtime of that Oklahoma State game, you're like, ah, this is why Arkansas's coach is on a hot seat. And it's like that in the other games, too. I mean, Auburn, I watched a little bit of that before Tennessee played Oklahoma, and then you know, watching the AM game. It's almost like every play for Arkansas is either like a touchdown or a big play or it's a disaster. I mean, particularly on offense, they're, they're kind of a roller coaster ride of an offense. And, um, you know, defensively, they've, they've been pretty solid. They didn't give up a lot uh, to, to Texas A&M, but, you know, fourth quarter of a tight game, A&M just ran it right down their throats on, on the go ahead drive, just handing the ball off several times. And so uh, Arkansas seems to be a team to me that can get you if you're not on it. But they also, in their two losses, have done a lot of things. And maybe even in the Auburn game, too, they were just outdone in, in this regard. But it seemed like Arkansas does a lot of things that loses them games, which is why uh, they've had a couple of, uh, of single game losses. And that was a big issue with them last season. You know, they were four and eight last year, right? But maybe five and seven, don't remember exactly. But in, they had like they're five, in yeah. they had like five one score losses. And, and, you know, when you do that, your mistakes like turnovers and penalties and, you know, things like that are just going to get magnified. And so, you know, they had a fake field goal that got, that got stuffed. Um, Little things that get you beat will get you beat um, if you do them consistently. So uh, that that's, that's why this game is a little tricky to me for Tennessee, just because, you know, Arkansas is so erratic, unpredictable. You don't know if you're going to get, you know, you, we, you touched on the quarterback, West Halen Green. I mean, it seems like every play he could break outside of the pocket and be gone for a 60-yard touchdown, or he could try to be too much and, you know, throw one into traffic or hold the ball too long and get stripped. I mean, it's it's, it's just that kind of helter-skelter uh, roller coaster that, that Arkansas seems to be on. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that that's a tough game to gauge, though, Ryan, because Arkansas just – they just, I don't know if it's like the Tennessee Florida game, but Arkansas just seems to find ways to lose. It's Texas AM. It's been 12 of 13. I think I saw a stat that said uh, AM has led in 12 and 10 of those, or trailed in 10 of those 12 wins. So mm-hmm. it just seems to be the Arkansas MO to have that game in late September in Jerry World and then uh, have it be there for the taking and then come out on the wrong end of a, of a close game. Yeah, I, I agree, and that's uh, that's obviously part of the frustration with Sam Sam Pittman. I I, I heard Houston not uh, talk at the uh, the Knoxville Quarterback Club on Monday, and he was asked about sort of Sam Pittman and just dealing with you know the the donors and everybody at Arkansas and how tough that job is. Basically. He, he would know. Yeah, he would know. Yeah, and and so w- one of the things he said was that, you know what you just point out, Patrick. He's lost a lot of close games, and and that tells you they're. They're close. They've done pretty well on the on the talent acquisition side of things, which is obviously challenge number one at a place like Arkansas because you're you know you've been in the SEC West for years, you know not anymore, but you're still dealing with a lot of the same teams, and you throw Texas and Oklahoma in there. They're just you got to have so much talent to keep up, and that's hard to get sometimes at a place like Arkansas. But then even when you do that well, you're still at best on par talent wise with a lot of those schools. So you you've got to execute, and that's that's that seems to be the sort of the the glass ceiling they've been dealing with the uh, this year and last year, especially they just the execution side has not has not been there. So I think they've they've got potential. They're one of those teams that can snap up and get you on the on the right day. Um, but to Patrick's point, they seem they seem a little mistake prone, and, and that's that's not a great place to be when you're facing a team like Tennessee that could that could win at the line of scrimmage, um, at least on defense. Uh, that that's. That's maybe the thing that surprised me a little bit about Arkansas Saturday, and we'll see if this is more Texas A&M because they've not struck me as a great offense so far under Mike Elko. They're okay. Um, but they Arkansas has got a pretty good defense, it looks like. They've got some guys up front that, that could cause some trouble. So 
I, I'll be interested in seeing how Tennessee plays at the line of scrimmage offensively. They they obviously didn't have a great night against Oklahoma and pass protection. They're going to have to hold up okay there against a, against a pretty decent Arkansas front. So I think Arkansas has a maybe a little better defense than I would have thought. Offense is about what I thought, which is to say that they can put up a pretty good number of points if it's the right day. But Petrino can draw up some stuff. He's always been able to to do that. So I think this will be the best offense Tennessee has played so far, but it's also a a decent defense. You're going on the road, and Wes, you and I have talked about how Tennessee seems to struggle at Arkansas historically. I don't know how much you put that – how much you weigh that going into a game like this when none of those – none of these current players were around for anything except the, what, 2020 game when Amari Thomas and some of those guys were freshmen. Um, so they, you know these guys haven't been there uh, to to play into that, but Tennessee does seem to struggle a little bit at Fayetteville, and even their wins are hard earned. So I would expect this to be a hard earned win for for Tennessee if they are going to win this game. Um, but it's still a game they should win. Arkansas doesn't look like a team that should beat Tennessee. They just look like one that could put up a, a real fight and make this a tougher game than people are maybe expecting. And I I do think it's the third toughest game left on Tennessee's schedule. Um, just being a tough road environment, night game. I, I think the only games tougher than this one left for Tennessee or Georgia and Alabama. Yeah, I, I still wonder about Florida. I still don't. I don't care what what the records are. I mean, that, that's a story for next week. But I, I still every every year against those guys, it's something. But yeah, that point that you made, I'll say this before we go to break. Arkansas does remind me a little bit of back when James Banks was was Tennessee's quarterback, and and Philip Fulmer said, you know, that every time he sees, he's like every time James touches the ball, either our band's going to play or their band's going to play, and I just hope it's our band. Is what you know? He used to say like somebody's band's going to be playing. I just hope it's Tennessee's because that some some it's either going to be a touchdown or a or, or something horrible. So, yeah, there is that bit of it, and I think I, I saw this. I don't want to be wrong on this stat, so I'm just using this as a vague number. But I think it was since Pittman's been there or something. Arkansas is something like three and twenty nine in games where it has trailed at any point during the fourth quarter. Wow! Which again, you would expect to have a sub five hundred record when you it trail at any point in the fourth quarter, right? You would expect that you would have an under 500 record, but, but that one is, if it's either three and 22, three and 26, it's something bad. It's three that, and a big number. And, and so that's, yeah. Definitely doesn't sound like you're making it up. No, oh, no, <laughs> no it, it's somewhere between 22 and 26. I think I'm going to, I'm going to say, well, whatever the number is, to your point, it basically sounds like – and they've been in a lot of close games is the other part of that. So if you've been in a lot of close games and you lose the lead at any point in the fourth quarter, it means you don't tend to pull out a lot of those games, like the Oklahoma State game, like the Texas A&M game. So that's that's the concern there is that, yeah, when you get in those close games, you don't know how to close the deal. And that's uh, – you know, Tennessee's got to show they can do that. You know, they've not been tested in a really close game yet. You know, they held on by 10, but that game was never really in doubt against Oklahoma. So – um so yeah, that if if they're tested in a game like like that, Arkansas is you know they've not had them go well, but they've been there. This Tennessee team hasn't really been tested to that point to be in a one possession game in the fourth quarter if it comes down to that. Nope, and uh, it seems like early on a lot of people don't think Tennessee will because the game opened at a ten and a half point spread, and then like like you snap your fingers and it was up to thirteen or fourteen. So money was getting hammered on Tennessee early in that one. So. Again, maybe the the betting public sure doesn't seem to care about Tennessee's history in Fayetteville, but um, we'll see if that matters to Tennessee or not. But we're slightly overdue for a break, so we're going to go ahead and get to that, and then we're going to come back and talk about what Tennessee did during the open date, what it needed to do during the open date, and uh, how many of those things are maybe realistic to, to change in a week. So, I mean, there's a interesting question there. We'll see if we can answer it or at least discuss it. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss it for sure. Whether we answer it, that's entirely up to uh, up to your own thoughts there when you're listening to this or what Tennessee does on Saturday. But before we get to that discussion, let's go pay some bills, listen to product services, in-house ads, et cetera, and then come right back here on the Go Balls 24-7 podcast. Hashtag ad. Welcome back to the Go Vols 24-7 podcast brought to you by whatever products, services, and in-house ads you just heard a moment ago. During that commercial break, Wes Rucker coming to you from Fort Rucker Studio. Patrick Brown coming to you from that undisclosed location. Ryan Callahan from his home uh, daycare center there down there in the dungeon where bad things happen. Um, you know, now you can see it. So you can tell he's added a little curtain there. So, I mean, we're, we're making progress. Um, but, but yeah, it's uh, it's still... 
it's i mean i don't i'm just saying like in a court of law that would look suspicious to a jury like some there's there's things happening there that are not good that's all i'm saying but we got a lot more to discuss in this hey you can look at me however you want buddy i'm just telling you what i'm seeing all right i'm telling you what i'm seeing we got a lot more to discuss in this podcast and we'll do that after a quick request from our end to please go in there rate review and subscribe to this podcast uh now it should be on uh, youtube and facebook and all those things so go hit that like button there uh, and and I know rating um, and, and reviewing all that, that that's important. What's really, really important is to hit that subscribe button and also to go in there and leave a review. If you've already left one, go leave a fresh one. That really helps us out in all the metrics because you can go get this podcast anywhere you can cast a pod. You can get this podcast. And we do this for free. Happy to do it for free. We'd like to keep doing it for free in perpetuity if we could. And what helps us do that is if you go in there and rate, review, and subscribe and tell your friends, tell people that you see. I even saw a couple of Tennessee hats out in London because, you know, they're Tennessee fans are everywhere, right? And you, you can't mistake that color. You know exactly what you're looking at when you see it. Uh, there's no mistaking it for anything else. Uh, so when you see those people, tell them about the Go Vols 24-7 podcast. Tell them that you can get us also on YouTube and on Facebook and all those places. And tell them to go to GoVols247.com. If you do all that stuff already, we thank you and we love you. If not, I award you no points and may God have mercy on your soul. And we're back. Guys, th this game right here coming up for Tennessee, we know that it was a, it, it was an open date, right? Tennessee coaches don't like to say bye week. Some, they're like, it's an open date, right? We, we get work done. You know, you usually... You, you get a day or two off early in the week, and then you, you get the weekend off, but you, you get a couple practices in during the week, and they're important practices um, because not only are you trying to get your team healthy, which is obviously a big thing in football, there's always stuff to work on. If you were Tennessee, what were the things during the open date that you're like, we got to get this, we, we, we got we to gotta look at this? Because obviously you're 4-0, you're right? You're doing a lot more good than bad. But if you want to be – the kind of team Tennessee wants to be and talks openly about being, they're going to have to be better in some areas than they have been. What, where do you think were the areas that going into this open date that they really needed to, to, to sharpen up? I, I'll, I'll say that it, uh, the, the offensive line is, is where I would start just in terms of the, the establishing some depth, continuing to, to bring some of those guys along um, because the most pressing area where they, they haven't shown, I guess that they have, capable backups that they really would would trust in a situation like what they ran to at Oklahoma it, it is off is the offensive line and specifically offensive tackle I think is one where people are are looking at this team and not not sure they'll be able to hold up there uh if, if John Campbell's chronic knee issues continue to be something that plague him from week to week you know you're gonna you're gonna have Dane Davis in there at times and and if that happens is that gonna work out um, over a, a lengthy period of time in a game, so he struggled, um, he struggled in Norman for sure. Yeah, so so it's, I and I and again we said this last week, but I, I think he's he's shown in the past he can play better than that. He's definitely capable of playing better than that. So I don't think anyone should just write off Dane Davis. He's he played a pretty good amount of football at Tennessee, and and that's not the player he always is. Now he's a little bit up and down, I think, and that's that's where Tennessee's got to got to get more consistent play there, but. You know, again, not many teams have great backup tackles uh, to turn to. Uh, that's a position that's tough to keep quality depth, certainly proven depth. So, but uh, but I would be bringing along Larry Johnson, doing everything you can during a week like that to continue to get him ready um, to see if those if any of those freshmen is is ready to to help in a pinch. I don't think you're going to need Jesse Perry or Bennett Warren or Jeremiah Hurd, anyone like that. But you need to keep bringing them along, and you need to keep bringing uh, the the guards in the center uh, along. You know, William Satterwhite at center. Uh, a guy who could be the heir apparent there, uh, the, the guards, you know, you might, you, you might need two new starters there next year. One might be from the transfer portal, but you still need someone who can come in next year and ideally be an internal candidate that's there now. So to me, youth, youth development on the offensive line was a big thing um, that I, I think they need to somehow work on while they're getting Lance Hurd and John Campbell healthy. Uh, and then, you know, maybe, maybe a little bit of the same in the secondary, because I don't think they've, Felt quite as comfortable with their depth beyond the top, the top one backup maybe at each position. I think Jalen McMurray at corner, you feel okay. Jacoby Thomas, obviously at safety, you feel okay. Boo Carter He's at star, really well. Yeah, yeah. Boo, Boo Carter at star, okay. Beyond that, I'm not sure how many guys you feel comfortable with in the secondary. So if there's a way to get a 
uh, a Jordan Matthews, a, a Caleb Beasley, you know, even even John Slaughter or someone like that, the safety position, um, ready and up to speed. Maybe even Christian Charles, not a young guy, but you, you need to continue to bring him along and get him um, settled in more at safety. But if you can get any of those guys ready and, and, and more capable of pushing for playing time or being reliable when you need them, I, I think that's a big thing too. But to me, that's kind of what open dates are for, working on some guys that you don't normally give first team reps and things like that. Cause you got to focus on the game plan. You don't have to do that in open date. So it's kind of fundamental work and youth development. So I, I would have looked at those two positions uh, first and foremost. Yeah. Ryan, I don't think it's a situation where, you know, you snap your fingers, have three open day practices and Jesse Perry is like ready to go. Um, right. I, I don't know. That's going to be something like that, but it is maybe a slow build. And uh, Josh Heupel did say on Monday that he thought his team, made good use of, of the open date. That's probably like, you know, the off season stuff we hear, like every team is bigger, stronger, faster, and everybody's bought in, you know, maybe it's those lines too, but like, um, yeah, he, he said that just the, the way they went about the work and meetings and on the practice field, he thought their practices were crisp was the word he used. So, um, and he's like this team's kind of workmanlike demeanor for most of the off season too. So, um, there's probably some truth in that, but, uh, yeah, he, he said too, that, you know, guys have to continue to stay ready. I mean, you, you never know if a guy like you know, Larry Johnson is going to be, you know, he, he probably didn't go into the Oklahoma game thinking, or maybe start Oklahoma week thinking I'm definitely going to play 40 snaps in this game, but in a pinch, he was in there and he had to respond. Um, and there's going to be other chances for that too. Um, I, I think they seem, the staff seems pretty pleased with how the depth is working out on defense. They're playing a lot of guys. I mean, you're seeing three, four, and five linebackers. They're playing – I think they played four safeties at, at Oklahoma a little bit. Uh, they seem pretty content with the top three corners there. So, um, But it is a, an important week for a guy, like you mentioned, like a Jordan Matthews, Ryan, or, or you know, uh, somebody like that that's maybe just outside of, of the rotation um, to make sure that you stay focused, stay locked in because an injury away and, and you know, they you might be playing a lot more. So – uh, yeah, that that's that's generally how open dates are. Is is you rest a lot of your starters and then your your backups and some of your young players get a little bit more attention, a little bit more work, and and, and in case they are needed down the road. And I mean, it's going to be a long long season. If if you're looking at four games, you you know it's it's a I'm trying to do some math here. It's a third of the regular season. But if you're Tennessee and you're you're aiming for the highest you can aim, it's maybe only a fourth of your season. So yep. uh, you're going to need anybody and everybody that can play at a high level for you, you're going to need them over the course of, of the season. Even if it's, you know, you blow out UTEP, you need those guys to play a half to, so you can rest guys, you know, you need those guys to stay ready. So they don't have to get ready. And, and that's what an open date is for. Yeah. I mean, to me, it, it, there was nothing more important that I could think of, at least in the here and now, than getting those offensive tackles as healthy as you can possibly get them. Right. Like, ice stem whatever it is get them off their feet whatever you got to do to get those guys ready to go because you need those other guys behind them to get ready too but i'm not sure that there's any version of those backups that could be better this season than those starters would be at their best so yeah you need both to happen but yeah you know that that's because there were things you saw pat i mean and ryan i mean we both we all watched the game there were things in the past game that Tennessee against Oklahoma that it just either didn't try to do because of the score or, and, or, and slash, or the fact that they were not protecting very well. Like Oklahoma's defensive line's pretty good. There's some good players on the edge. They mix up stuff. Venables is really good at disguising things. And, you know, Nico was getting hit and Nico was getting hurried and they didn't need it because of the way the game was flowing when the defense was so good, but there was stuff they just weren't going to try in that game. Yeah, we, we talked a lot about the tackle situation last week. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's a chance for those guys to get ready. It's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a weird time for an open date. A lot of Tennessee's open dates in the past when there's only been one during a season have come six, seven games in. So this, after four games, felt a little bit earlier. And Heupel even kind of touched on this last week. He even kind of said that um, – your first one's going to be a little bit more of a chance to work on yourself, to give, you know, focus on player development, things like that. And, and your second one, which for Tennessee, they really only play three more games between now and that one before playing five to close it out. Um, that's the one where you're kind of 
maybe R and R is maybe a little bit more of the emphasis. So it, yeah, I mean, there are guys like Lance Hurd and, you know, I'm sure you, you take a chance to give Dylan Sampson a, a few days off from getting hit and guys like Cooper Mays, Javante Sprague, and you probably don't need to work those guys in a whole lot. Um, maybe some of those defensive linemen, you know, that don't need, that have a lot of tread on the tires. They don't need a whole lot of work, but um, this wasn't necessarily a, Man, they got to get like tw- they got to get like twelve guys healthy this week. I don't I don't know it was like that. I mean, I think players will benefit um, from the physical and mental break that you get from not having to play and not having to be in game week mode. But it's still, um, you know, it, it's just, it's just four games into the season, and Tennessee's had two games where a lot of their main guys haven't even played more than a half. So uh, that that maybe wasn't the, the main focus, but it's still as you said, Wes, and um, and. and to his point too, Ryan, I mean, it's a chance to get guys, Lance Hurd, you know, Campbell's situation is going to be what it is all season, but, you know, you can get him off his feet a little bit and, and hopefully have him for a full, uh, as full of workload as you can get him in Arkansas moving forward. Yeah, because I think some of that stuff that, you know, just the pass game in general could work on, I, I mean, the very first part of that is the pass protection. Like, that's the first component to any of it. It is – you know that you think about the chain of things that need to happen, right? You need a good snap, obviously. That's the first one. But but like you got to protect the quarterback. Then you have to have separation from the receiver. Then you have to have quarterback making a good decision. Then you have to have a quarterback delivering an accurate ball. Then you got to worry about the receiver making the play. But the it's like if if any one of those things doesn't happen, the rest of them don't matter. And the first one is protection. Like there have been issues at times in the past where Tennessee, I don't think pass protected well enough to even put a tremendous amount of blame on anybody else because that that's where it starts. And and I think the way they were getting pressure off the edges, Oklahoma was, I should say in that game was a concern and Tennessee was able to mitigate that. Obviously um, was able to run the ball, was able to to build that lead, get good field position, capitalize on a couple drives and put pressure on Oklahoma and the field tilt the way that was going on during the game. Like it, it worked out well for Tennessee in that way because if Tennessee had had to force the issue a little bit more with with the pass game, maybe it would have happened. I don't know that it would have because they were giving up too much pressure off the edges. And and that's why I think one thing that mitigates that, I talked about this a little bit last week, is Nico running the ball is a way to alleviate some of that. That 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 backs off some of the pressure, but that also means Nico's going to get hit more. And he was already getting hit a little more bit more than you would have wanted so i don't know where that because that's where the whole thing starts with me i mean pass pro you got to be good up the middle too right center guard center those guys have to be able to keep the pocket up um and then the tackles push people wide and then you've got a pocket but and backs and tight ends got to do their job but those tackles i mean that's that's an area where I mean, there's a reason why NFL teams pay, pay as much as they do for that position. And there's a reason why Lance Hurd was such a commodity in the portal was because it's important. Like they, they need to get those guys back. They need Hurd back. Uh, they need the most they can get out of Campbell and they need Davis to play better because he can play better. Even if he's maybe a little better at guard than he is at, at tackle, he's good enough at tackle. We've seen that before. Uh, he just, he wasn't in that game and they, they can't have all three of those things happen. They can't have Hurd not available and Campbell not available and Dane Davis not playing well. Because if those three things happen, Tennessee's not going to beat the best teams on its schedule. So that's to me where it starts. Is that wrong to say? No, I, I don't think so. No. I, and yeah, to that point, one of the things I think Nico needs to work on is maybe speeding up his internal clock a little bit in some yeah. situations. And that, that, and that problem is only going to be compounded if the pass protection continues to be shaky too. That's, you know, hard to assign blame on, on those strip sacks to anyone, but the, but the tackles, but you know, when you know your pass protection is not going to be there, it might cause a quarterback to speed things up too much and kind of panic and get rid of the ball. That's where you can get into making out a character mistake. So it, 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 it affects everything in the passing game when the, when the pass protection is not there. And, and you're right. It's gotta, it's gotta be there if Tennessee is going to be going to be good. And, and if it's not, Nico's got to, got to work on, you know, knowing when to get out of the pocket and making the right decisions on when to run, when not to not just running at the first sign of trouble, you know, learn to be patient, but also still making the right decisions when you need to get out. So it opens up a lot of, a lot of potential problems when the pass protection is not there 
And, and if you miss our discussion this last week, I know our, our I don't think our podcast last week was um, on Thursday was or Friday, I guess it was, was uh, up, uploaded to our usual channels yet. Has it been Wes? Um, so you might have missed that one. I know we posted it on I on the am, checkerboard. I am actually not sure because in all candor, I got home very late last night. Yeah. And then I'm still trying to catch up on some stuff. So I don't know that I, that that was uh, I'm passing the book to Benjamin McKeel. Yes. I don't so, know. I was going to say that. I know it's on our YouTube page and you can see it on, on, on govals 247com but if you're if you're getting it through the uh, the usual podcast distribution channels you might not have gotten that. So if you missed it last week there is really no issue with Lance Hurd in the sense uh, like that thing's taken on such a life of its own just with rumors and stuff. Lance Hurd didn't play because of an ankle injury. Um, that there was some people in his circle that maybe didn't we're not on the same page with Tennessee in regard to thinking that he should be able to play, but this wasn't an NIL deal. It's not the, the UNLV quarterback situation or anything like that. And it's not a lingering injury where we think it's going to be a huge issue. That, the rumor, rumor, rumor mill got going crazy when I was across the pond. What, what were y'all, what were y'all doing there? Were you churning? It, were, you, were you putting grist for the mill in there? What was going on? Yeah. Just, just, just innuendo related to, you know, a comment uh, about, you know, what, whatever it was with, with her, is construed a certain way. And the next thing you know, that, and you know, the UNLV quarterback leaves for over an NIL deal that he says he was promised. And next and thing then, you know, people, the, are, the new guy comes in there and just kicks ass. And <laughs> right. And, and next, but the next thing you know, people are thinking, Oh, well, this is a, this is something like that. Is it? There's an NIL angle to this too. No, nothing like that. So it, it's an injury thing. He's going to be fine. Uh, everyone's expecting him back for the Arkansas game. John Campbell, you know, should be back for the Arkansas game. Haven't heard anything different on that front. It's just, again, a matter of whether he can play the whole game. So, uh, yeah, that, you're, you're going to be fine there, but those guys have to hold up and you got to play well. And, uh, and, and if one of them's shaken up, you've got you've to make sure that whoever, Dane Davis and, uh, or anybody else is in, it's in the lineup to replace them uh, is holding up well. Because, yeah, to your point, Wes, the tackle position is really important and, and – You've got to keep keep Nico upright, keep him healthy. He's he's going to be really good, I think. But you've got to got to give him chances to do what he can do uh, for that passing offense to to take off the way it's capable of. Yeah, it changes the menu. The there's a menu that coaches can order from in a game, right? And it's like if if you are if you're struggling to pass pro at, at tackle then all of a sudden you're like ordering off the late night only menu, right? Like you're not getting the full dinner menu of options on plays you can run and concepts you can have because you can't, you can't get all, you don't know that that's going to work. So yeah, it changes everything before we get out of here, the guys and, and move on. There are just other things throughout. Ryan mentioned the, some of the stuff there in the secondary and developing some depth there. Um, I think at linebacker, I still feel pretty good about those guys. I'd still, you'd like to see another guy or two step up, but I think the ones who have played by and large have played well. But this game could be a different kind of challenge for them because th this is the kind of game where you're having to really kind of put all three links of the chain together on defense in order to keep a mobile quarterback from busting out of the pocket and giving you problems, right? Th these are ones where, where you have to keep the thing you have to keep the string tied together and the linebackers are maybe the most essential part to that. Like they've got to, they've got to stay in their lanes. They've got to keep contained. Um, I don't know if they're going to spy or not. They've not spied a ton in the past. So we, we might not see that. Um, Pat's more of the film guy in, in some ways. He would correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I don't think they spy very often. Do they? Uh, no, I would say they probably just play more zone where maybe a mixture of man and zone where they have guys, particularly the linebackers just have their eyes on the quarterback. And, and I feel like straight up shadow, but maybe that would be the game for this. And, and, and you, how, have, how, you trust a guy like Arion Carter to sort of be the yeah. that guy we, you know, we've seen them use even Pierce. Uh, you know, he, he doesn't, they like to do some different things with him on third down as, as I don't know, it seems counterintuitive sometimes to take your best pass rusher and not let him get after the quarterback. I'm not, that's not a criticism. I think it's good to, and that's something that Tim Banks, I think, has always done a good job of is particularly Makes on those third down calls. He he will throw different things at different times and sort of pick his spots. And uh, sometimes the nature of defensive play calling is sometimes what you do works and sometimes it doesn't. But, I mean, they, I think there are enough athletic guys for Tennessee to, to if they wanted to have some spies in some situations to do that. But certainly they're going to need to try to keep Green from just running rampant on him, which he can do. But 
uh, as, as Heupel said on Monday, sometimes you can be in the, in the good position. He just outruns you. That's just something you're going to have to, uh, that's something that we'll have to watch for in this game is, is how many times does Tennessee have guys in position to keep him in the pocket or get him to the ground. And he just makes a play. Cause you know, that's going to happen. That's what he does. And sometimes that's just football. Well, I guess then in that case, the last thing I'll say is this, I think something that we might talk about this a little bit later in the week too, and we'll see if we can get some of our friends from, from, from Trey Biddy and his boys over there at Arkansas to, to get us some info this week. But I think one thing that helps Tennessee a lot in this game is the fact that it's coming off a bye and Arkansas is not. And the reason I say that is because this Tennessee team is, especially on defense, it is very, very physical. You saw going into that game, like Oklahoma's injury report before and after the game, Tennessee gave Oklahoma one of the rudest welcomes to the SEC you could possibly imagine with two or three of those hits during the game were absolutely devastating hits. Legal, completely clean as a whistle, but just physical, nasty type of stuff. And if I'm Arkansas and I know I've already – played a couple tough games i've gone on the road to play oklahoma state uh, i've gone um you know on the road for neutral side anyway to play a&m which always has some physical guys who can hit you i gotta think arkansas is a little bit beaten up physically as well as maybe psychologically right now and tennessee is it's good for arkansas that you're playing them at home because that's a tough that's a that's a nice environment but man tennessee is a team that's gonna you're gonna feel tennessee after you play that team arkansas has got some Physical runners too, though. Uh, Jaquin yep. and Jackson, the transfer from Utah, he's a bulldozer. And uh, right. Ryan, isn't Bra- is Braylon Russell the one that Tennessee thought they were going to get until some yeah some late in the process? I don't want to say shenanigans, but uh, whatever. Yeah, no, he's no, listed he's he's at six one two fifty three, so he's I'm he's a big dude. Shenanigans. No shenanigans. shenanigans. No, no, no shenanigans there. Just 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 recruiting stuff. But yeah, no, uh, that was one where Tennessee. Definitely was in good shape at one point, and then you know, hey, Arkansas, the home state school, they battled hard and and won that one. But yeah, he's a big dude. That, he's that six one two fifty three is what I'm getting at. Yeah, that's that's. I mean, yeah, I, I'm confirming when he was a recruit. I I don't remember off the top of my head of what the weight was, but it was way higher than what he was listed at. I remember at one point I so, saw him. Yeah. I saw him in one of like you know because Ron, I do like one or two max recruiting things per year usually, and they you know, he was at one of the camps that I went to because I guess nobody else could be there, so they yeah. called my worthless behind in there, and he was one of the kids who I saw and went. Hey Ryan, who the hell is that? That yep. kid is big. Who is that kid? It was Braylon Russell. Big kid. Yeah, he's big. Yep, he's big. Kid. Yeah, I think he was two fifty uh, or somewhere around that as a senior in high school. So yeah, that that would be in the ballpark uh, for sure. So yeah, he's a he's a big dude. Yeah, they've they've got some. I, I agree, some physical runners. They'll 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 challenge Tennessee. I think both sides of the ball. This and, would be a and physical game. Rece- and some big receivers too, Ryan. For sure. And, and, you know, that's we didn't touch on this you know, earlier. That's that's one of the areas I was going to say I feel pretty good about Tennessee is a, a corner. Maybe may Ricky Gibson less so, but Jermod McCoy for sure. But those guys are going to be challenged by some physical receivers that uh, have shown they can make some plays. And they've Arkansas kind of has some depth there too. You know, they you, you rattle off the names, you're like, oh man, they got four or five guys you can count on there. So they uh, they're they're pretty solid at receiver, not not stars, but. Um, so pretty pretty solid players that can that can make a play uh, at any given time. So uh, I, I think they they will challenge Tennessee in some ways. And, but yeah, I think this definitely helps Tennessee to be coming off an open date, not just strategy wise, getting ready for a running quarterback. You know, possibly a couple running quarterbacks, depending on what you face uh, at, at Florida. You know, you're going to face one against Alabama, so you've got kind of a run here where you might be facing a lot of quarterback runs and things like that. Uh, a lot of scramble drill type type plays you've got to defend. So. Uh, probably probably a good idea this week for, for Tennessee to do a lot of work on that. And, um, and yeah, to, to that point, the secondary shown it can cover pretty well, but have they shown they can cover for five, six seconds when a quarterback buys time? That, that's one of the areas where this and secondary anybody maybe, really do that. Yeah, and, and that's, that's, gonna, that's where this secondary maybe hasn't been tested in the way that they will be tested this week because I think certainly, um, certainly Arkansas is capable of, of making some plays in that way. No, I think those are good points on our way out the door. I think those are good points. I, I just think I think when you look at, you know, the the that Tennessee defensive front and you look at Keenan Peely and you look at Carter and you look at um, you know, guys like Thomas on the back end, like I I, I don't think they're gonna be hesitant to go up and hit anybody. So those are some big strong dudes and they're they're gonna hit you. So I think Tennessee physically feels like it's gotta be in pretty good shape for this one. If if 
the offensive tackles are, are, are good to go. And, and we think that they will be, but I mean, we thought that at times a little bit for the previous game too, and it didn't work out that way. So we shall see, but we'll be back also later in the week. We'll have at least one more episode um, before, before the, the game on Saturday, maybe two, we will see, um, but we'll definitely be back on Thursday for sure. And we'll have more to discuss about that. Ben is sorry that he couldn't be here. He's doing some uh, baseball coverage today as uh, the national champions have, uh, have begun their, their fall practice. And so, they're, they're getting the work in, and Ben's going to be there because he's there every time they open the door for baseball, which is, again, why our website is awesome because we cover every sport as well as it can be covered. So uh, but he'll be back later in the week with us, and we'll at least one of you jokers will be back with me later this week. So we will get it to you. But thanks, regardless, for being here today. Ron, you got one more thing? No, I'm pointing to this guy. He's going to be there on Thursday, right? Oh, your point. Oh, that. Oh, well, yeah. you were Hollywood. You were Hollywood squaresing it by. Yeah. I guess mine would be like that way, right? Like this guy over yeah. here. Okay, this. Now that we're on YouTube, yeah, we're trying to get used to that. No more nose picking. No more nose picking. That's going to be out there uh, in in 4K for the world to see. So, uh, guys, thanks for being here today, though. And um, if you're watching on YouTube, this will be the end of it. But if not, you'll hear uh, the outro to the podcast. But for now, Pat, Ryan, thanks for being here, guys. Thanks, Wes. See you, Wes. <laughs>